about this to this morning is I'm entitled the message a more excellent way a more excellent way the past um, at the conference I preached a message on the bond of perfection speaking about charity and um, that message that I preached at the conference more than any other message I've preached before people came to me afterwards and spoke to me about that this, how much the message mean to them, meant, what, how much it meant to them to have charity and what the Bible had to say about that and how they felt like, you know, they not always charitable in their own lives. Obviously, when I preached the message, I was talking about my own charity that I feel is lacking, okay? And, um, and, and charity is the bond of perfectness. It's, it's the very bond, it's the very ligament, it's the very glue that holds the perfect man together and how he relates to others. And so we're going to consider that message. I decided to do that for the next few weeks to break it up and not chase through it through one 45-minute session, but to break it up into a more, you know, where we can talk about some of the things that, is, that I just touched basically briefly on. But to, um, as we start there, also, this morning, I want to, you know, as I welcome you all here this morning, um, a special welcome to the church and, and, and Port Elizabeth again, um, who will be joining us for the next few weeks um, in the messages that we preach. Geliefdes, brothers and sisters, and in Jesus Christus, genade viel en vrede van God onze Vader en ons Heer Jesus Christus. So, that's just me speaking Afrikaans to them, but some of them speak Afrikaans, so they can understand. All right, did you get that, Jeanette? You didn't get that? You should know. Come on, man. All right, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read a lengthy passage this morning. And when that baby walks past here, and you guys look at that baby, I'm telling you guys, no. This morning, Robert was preaching, and Brianna walked out with the baby out here, and everybody's like, and Robert's like, hey, I'm talking here. Nobody's listening to me. <laughs> so um, she's going to be a real spoiled little one in this church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31. When the book of Corinthians is written, you guys have to understand this. When the book of Corinthians was written, it was written in a transition period where God was, where, where, the, where the dispensation of the kingdom ended and the, and the dispensation of, of, the, of, the, of grace started. And there's a transition in that period and it was, in a, it was written during a time where God was in the process of revealing His Word and revealing His truth and, and making known the revelation of the mystery in that process. So in that process, there were some spiritual gifts still active in the church at that time that God dispensed. Gifts of tongues and of prophecies and of knowledge and interpretation and, and healings and etc., etc., etc. All those gifts were active at that time. They are no longer active today because God's Word is completed. In the next, and after I finish this series, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a short series on why we rightly divide. And I'm going to give you a complete overview from Genesis to Revelation on why we rightly divide. It's going, to be, it's going to be helpful for you. And if you say, well, I know that information. I don't need to listen to it. Well, can you teach that information to somebody else? And if you're not able to do that, you need to come and take notes on that. Okay. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in the church at the time, we know about the Corinthian church, they were carnal, they were babes in Christ, and they were all arguing about who's got the best spiritual gift. You know, not all, but they, some of them were doing that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, he says, And now abideth, abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is what? Charity. I'm not reading, I'm reading the wrong verse. I want to read second, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians, sorry. Did I say 2 Corinthians? I mean 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So at that time, he says, covet the best gifts, which was still active at that time. But he says, but, he says, and yet, Show I unto you a more excellent, if, if the gifts were so great, here's something he's going to give them that is more excellent. That's actually going to be culminated 
and it's going to be find the pinnacle of God's revelation, which is going to be charity. Once you get it, look at chapter 13. Yes, it's a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I just make noise. That's all I do. It's make noise if I don't have charity. It's just a bunch of noise I make. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And we'll then talk about these verses in the next couple of weeks. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So would you say charity is important? It's important. And it's important for us to understand what charity is. Okay? And we're going to talk about that. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Find yourself sometimes not kind to fellow members of the body of Christ? Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the what? Truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Charity never fails. But there's something that will fail, according to the Scriptures now. Look at this. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall what? Cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. When will all these things vanish away, where charity still abides? Well, let's read on. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Let me ask you, when Paul was writing this, did Paul had the full revelation of the mystery yet? No. He was progressively still being revealed to the revelation of the mystery, and it only gets completed after Acts 28. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come. So he says, when that which is perfect is come, not when he that is perfect is come, but when that which is perfect has come, is come, then that which in part shall be done away. What do we, what's in part according to the previous verse? Prophecy. This is not in part. This is going to be full. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I taught as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, at the time when Paul was writing this, for now we see through a glass darkly. Did Paul have the full revelation of the mystery when he wrote this? No. Everything was still murky. It wasn't clear. But then, when is then? When that which is perfect. But then... Sorry, um, for now we, 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 we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face it will be clear. Now I know in part, as prophecy is in part, but then I shall know even as I will know. So when that which is perfect has come. That which is perfect has come is not talking about, and we'll talk about this in the next few weeks, is not talking about Jesus Christ coming back in the second coming. That which is perfect has come is the completion of God's word, and I'll prove it to you what God's word is saying. For now we, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And now obeyeth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is what? Charity. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gift, but rather that ye may prophesy. What is the more excellent way? Is charity. What do we need to do? Follow after charity. It's a more excellent way. And so we want to talk about that. I want to, while you have that, go with me to Colossians. The book of Colossians chapter 3. 
And yet, in, uh, sorry, in First Corinthians, we're going to look at verse chapter eight there. But go to Colossians chapter three. Are you guys following me? Does it make sense when I speak and you follow my words? Because to me, it sounds like I'm just like <laughs> going out of my mouth. Are you guys following what I'm saying, right? This is terrible, man. And it's all because of my vanity. You know, when I take a thing out, I can talk. You know, and then, but then I have a, a tooth missing, and you're like, ooh. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 says, well, let's go read verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man hath a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above these things, put on the more excellent way. You say, above these things, a more excellent way. Above these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. You can forbear one another, you can forgive one another, but you, you can say, I forgive you, but don't have charity in my heart. What I need to do if I want to continue to forgive you, if I want to continue to, to, to um, uh, um, do that, and I show you mercies and kindness and meekness and long-suffering, what holds that together on an ongoing basis is what? Charity. Because I can say, I'm kind to you today, but tomorrow I'm not going to be kind to you anymore. But if charity is what holds it all together, I will still be kind to you tomorrow. That's what charity does. Charity, we're going to talk about the definition of charity. Charity is unconditional. Charity is not conditional. It's unconditional. It's an action that we require to believe God's word for it to work in us. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm just giving you the verses that we're going to talk about in the next few weeks. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8. To the Corinthians, he's showing them a more excellent way, which is charity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 and 2 and 3. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity does what? Edify. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. What does charity do? Charity edifies. What does knowledge do? It puffs up. And I always say that knowledge by itself is a very dangerous thing for a believer. Because many people learn some new truths. They hold on to it. Oh, I got the knowledge of this. And then they want to tell other people, enforce it unto other people without charity, and they're not building them up. Knowledge, here's my statement about knowledge, knowledge in the absence of wisdom and spiritual understanding is dangerous. When you have knowledge and you have the wisdom and spiritual understanding of that knowledge, then you're profitable. That's what Paul is praying for the saints, not just for knowledge. Oh, fill your head with all the knowledge of right division. Oh, we rightly divide, and we know better than you, and we King James only, and we murder and you guys are all losers. That's not charity. When you have that knowledge, you understand the importance with wisdom and spiritual understanding, how you're going to minister to somebody else with kindness and long-suffering and forbearing and with all that, without anger and with all those, those other things. Go with me to Colossians chapter 1 quickly. Colossians chapter 1. By the way, when I was speaking about, when I was preparing this message, a few weeks, some time back already, I always had this message in the back of my mind because it's something that challenged me. As, I'm point, as I say to the conference, I'm pointing a finger at you maybe this morning. You say, oh, you point the finger. And I shouldn't be pointing the finger at anybody. But I'm going to tell you this, when I do this, you see those three fingers? It points right back at me first. Okay? So I, I, I'm, I'm, I, this is spoken to my heart first. I realize that I'm not always charitable. I know that. Okay? 
Because sometimes some of you guys make it really hard for me to be charitable. <laughs> it's just the truth. You know? But I have to forbear you in love, which is charity. Okay? First Corinthians of Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Look at what he says to the Colossians. He says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that he might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Does he stop there? No, look at what he says. The knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He doesn't stop for you to be filled with the knowledge of his will, but he wants you to be filled with the no he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Because when we have the knowledge in wisdom and spiritual understanding, guess what's the result? Verse, verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. Why are the Corinthians not walking worthy of the, of the Lord? Why were the Corinthians not walking worthy as carnal babes? Why were they walking like that? Because they had knowledge puffed them up. They didn't have, they didn't have knowledge in wisdom and spiritual understanding of the Scriptures. That's why they were arguing. They didn't care about the next guy. The Corinthians came in and said, like, we can have a potluck today out here. And one we normally say, tarry ye one for another. So Chris, you can't eat all the meat when you go up first, okay? You've got to leave some meat for us too. Tarry one for another. Charity will tell you, Chris. No, Chris doesn't do that. I'm just giving this a hard time. Charity will tell you to wait on the other guy. To have everybody. That's what charity does. Knowledge says, I can eat anything I want. It's been given by thanksgiving and prayer. But... If this is going to offend the next guy, then I have to be careful how I... Charity will help me to not do that to the detriment of the other. You get that? So these Corinthians, I mean, they were taking one another to court, to the law before unbelievers. They were drunkenness. They go to a, like a pot like here, and some of them, will, they will get full, and there's other people that's in the church at the time that didn't get any food, and they go hungry home. And these other guys just eat. And they were getting drunk. By the way, just, I might show you this something. Because there's something that came up at the conference. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll just give this for your information. This is a rabbit trail right now. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Is that true? Yes or yes? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, <coughs> excuse me, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor what? Drunkards. Right? Nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. He says, you were of that drunkards. You were some of those guys. But some of you, but you, your position you have now in Christ, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That's who you are. You are, you and I, we are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified in the name of the Lord. That's who we are. We were drunkards. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, some of them are getting drunk. Those people that were drunkards, they're still getting drunk, but they now are washed and sanctified and justified. So that means they're sanctified, justified, and washed person in, in, in the blood of Christ, that person can still get drunk and be carnal in his actions. Do you get what I'm saying? That's who we were. So we shouldn't be behaving like that. So he's praying for them. And so that's what charity do. So what I want to do through this series, I really want to encourage all of us, we want to encourage one another, to have God's Word working in us to produce charity and, let up, and, 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 and in, in our conversation, in our walk one with another and let it be the bond of our perfected fellowship that holds us together. My relationship with you, Jordan, needs to be held together by the bond of perfectness, of charity. And so we need to be one another. And sometimes I can... Ch 
charity doesn't mean I don't rebuke you, or I don't reprove you, or I don't correct you. When I rebuke you, reprove you, or correct you, instruct you, I do that with a spirit of love. I speak the truth in love. I do it in a spirit of charita- being charitable to you. Don't think, oh, charity, I can get away with everything. No, no. Paul tells these guys, he tells the Corinthians, I love you. I love you. In 1 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he says, the more I love you, the less I be loved. Okay? So charity is going to, we want that bond of perfectness that holds this fellowship together and help us to edify the body of Christ. The church today is more fragmented than it ever was today. Even grace churches are more fragmented than it ever was. You know why we get so fragmented? It's not because of the truth. Because the, thru- the truth never, sometimes the truth will cause a division for, for those that don't have the truth. But most of the time, what divides us is pride, it's sin. It's I. I want to have the preeminence. I want to be right, and you have to be wrong always. I have to know this. You don't know this. That's the pride that breaks us up most of the time. If it was charity, we'll work it out. But it's other way. It will be the other way around. Why we have so many fractions today is because people are chasing their own pride. They have a lack of charity. What we need is the truth of God's Word that holds us together because every member in the body of Christ, every member in the body of Christ is joined to the head. Every member. Whether you're the pinky, little toe, we're all connected to the head. And if we're connected to the head, what we need to do as a body, we need to edify ourselves in love. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. We're going to come back to this passage later on. I'm not going to do it right now, but we'll come back to this passage maybe next week. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together in Christ, and compacted by that every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body into the edifying of itself in what? The way that the body edifies in God's design in the body of Christ is for perfected saints to do the work of the ministry to edify the body of Christ. Every perfected saint, every saint is joined to who? The head of the body, which is what? Christ. Jay, if I take your head and cut it off this morning, you, you're no longer Jay. You can't function. You'll go poop down, okay? You won't even go like a chicken and run for a while. Right? Because you, 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 the head is what feeds the whole body. What tells me to speak to you now, what making my, 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 my thought and how my hand's going to go for the next moment, if I'm going to point something, I'm going to look at these guys here, all, every action in my body comes from the head. So in the body of Christ, we, our function and our walk comes from the head. That's who we are in Christ. And we connect it to the head and it edifies itself in love. It's designed in this way to take care of itself and to build itself up. And if we bite and devour one another, what we do is we're breaking the body of Christ. We're not edifying it. And it's the way we, that we bite and devour one another is because we fail to see our connection to the head. And we're not edified by our charity and hold together by that, that action. You, you follow? You're my job, Ephesians chapter 4. Our vocation. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Are we being called to walk worthy of the vocation? Brother Tim talked about that a week ago. Is it a week ago? He talked about the subject. I listened to his message. It was a good message. 
We are called to walk worthy of our vocation. We all have a job. We all have a vocation that God has given us in Christ Jesus. And we need to walk worthy of that, with your, with we are called, with all lowliness and meekness. Lowliness and meekness. Not with pomp and ceremony. Not with, you know, puffed upness. But with lowliness and meekness. With long suffering. Forbearing one another where? In love. The way that I forbear you in love. That's what charity is all about. To forbear you in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You have the bond of perfection, charity, and you have the bond of peace. To keep that all together. That's our vocation, guys. And we need to give attention to this. So go back now. And we want to look at the subject of, we're going to talk about all these verses as, as, as we come up. What is charity? What is charity? We want to ask ourselves the question, what is charity? Okay. Some say charity is just love. Well, that's not quite an accurate definition of it. It's part of it. But it's not a quite an accurate definition of that. I go to the, to the Webster's 1828, if, I, if you will. I'll give you this. This is what they say charity is. In a general sense, it means love, a benevolence, to show benevolence, to show goodwill, that disposition of the heart which inclines men to think favorably of their fellow men and to do them good. In a theological sense, that's just what the Webster says. It's not what the Dez says, it's what the Webster says. In a theological sense, it includes the supreme love of God and universal good will to all men. That's what charity is. The other part of charity definition is its arms. Whatsoever is bestowed gratuitously on the poor for their relief, a charitable institution. Let me tell you, charity in the Bible is not the same way charity has been defined by the world today. Today, when somebody says you're charitable, it means you're giving money to the poor to help them out. You wrote a check and you gave money or you gave food, you're charitable. Yeah, that's part of that's charity. But, it, but the Bible, when it uses the word charity, it uses a different. Every time the word charity in your Bible is used, it's not used in a sense of taking care of the poor, of you writing a check. One of the things, a lot of people came to me after the message in Chicago, is like, you never said charity about writing out the check. I'm like, where was your mind going about the check, 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 check? But, you know, charity is not what I'm giving to the poor. You know, well, it's charitable. But charity, the scripture tells us what charity is. I believe it is a particular kind of love. It's a particular kind of love. It's a love that unconditionally seeks the benevolence of others to their edification. Unconditionally seeking the benevolence of others for their edification. That is what charity is. Okay? That's what charity is. Charity cannot be divorced from the love of God, God's love. Can't divorce it from that. Charity is a result of God's love in the Scripture. We have charity because of God's great love, because of the love of Christ. That's why we have charity. You can't divorce it from that love of God. Interesting, in my Afrikaans Bible, the word for love, by the way, you see your King James Bible doesn't use, in my King James Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says charity. It doesn't say love. And I will never change the word love, uh, charity, and scratch it out and put love in there because it means exactly the same thing. Because if that's the case, then why did they translate that? Now we're going to go through all arguments about translations and all that stuff. I'm going to just choose to believe what the scriptures say there. It uses the word charity. Because it, it seeks the unconditional benevolence of the other's edification. That's what it does. My Afrikaans Bible uses the word, the word love, for some of you guys listening today, the word love in, in Afrikaans is liefde. In, the Dutch, in Dutch, it's also the word liefde. L-I-E-F-D-E. Liefde. Love. 
But if my Afrikaans Bible doesn't say, Liefde suffers long, love suffers long. It says, the love. Every time charity is used, it uses the love. Not just love. It's that specifically, specific kind of love. It's not just any love. It's that specific kind of love. Same with the Dutch. The Dutch has started for tongue. That's the same thing. Die liefde. De liefde. You don't say, we don't say, we charity God. Do you say that? No, we say we love God because He first loved us. You don't say we charity God. I don't say I charity you because it's bad English for me to say we, I charity you, Jordan. No, I love you. I don't charity you. When I, when I show my actions toward you, it will be what? Charity. Charity is an action based on truth. You can love God and you can love the devil. You can love good and you can love evil. That's the reality of it. But you can't charity evil. You can't charity good. Do you get what I'm saying? It's different. And we have to understand that. Now, I know that a lot of you guys are going to come to me this morning and you know I don't like to go into doing the Greek, old Greek thing. But the first thing somebody says, well, yeah, you know, the, the charity is, it's, it's agape. It means the love of God. Well, agape doesn't always mean the love of God. Agapeo doesn't mean, it's agape and agapeo. Do you know anything about Greek? I've studied some, and I know some. I know the two words. And I know one is a noun and one is a verb. I understand that. But I'm not going to try and convince you of that. I'm not going to give you this the stuff that people say was well, agape, but let me show you something about, if you know anything, and I'm just going to give this to you, because I'm not replacing the scripture with any more new meaning, I just want to give you an explanation. That not every time the word agape or agapeo is used, does it necessarily mean the love of God. Go with me to a couple of passages. Second Peter chapter 2. I'll just show you this quickly. Second Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter two and verse fifteen. He's talking about Balaam, the son of Bozar. In verse fourteen, he says, "Having eyes full of adultery and and and, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls." You guys, Second Timothy, right? Uh, second, Second Peter. I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter. Um, 2 and verse 14 and 15. Second, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Having eyes full of adultery, uh, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which has forsaken the right way, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of righteousness. That word love there, you go look at a search and the word love there is agape. So be careful when you start telling people agape is the love of God. Because that's not the love of God that loves the wages of unrighteousness. The same way with John. I'm going to just give you a couple of verses. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And verse 19. John chapter 3 verse 19 says, And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men loved darkness. That word loved darkness is the word agapeo. Agape. First John 2, and I'm going to, last one, First John, and we finish with this. First John, not finished with a message. You guys get happy for nothing. I'm not finished, done yet, so... 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. I'm just going to show you. Be careful. Love not the world. 1 John 2, 15. It's interesting how these verses are all 2, 15, 2, 15, 2, 15, right? 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love, the world there is agapeo. 
the love of the Father is agape. So be careful with this stuff. Love the world, you know. So, you know, so let's go back to charity. The issues of chari charity in your Bible. You guys got what I was saying there? Be careful when you say, oh, well, agape. You know what? If you don't know anything about it, don't bring those words up unless you've studied the subject in detail. Just stick with your King James Bible. It says charity and believe the word charity and hang on to the word charity and means it's an action word based on doctrine built up inside of you and it, shows the, it seeks the benevolent, unconditional edification of others. As you, as you mean, as you, just believe that. The word charity in your Bible is used 28 times. 28 times the word charity is used. Once it's used as charitable. Every time the word charity is used in your Bible, every time the word charity is used in your Bible, it's always used in light of your relationship with other believers. You understand what I'm saying? It's always used in the relationship you have with other fellow believers, the word charity. So think about that. Charity can be, is displayed in the church in the following way. Go with me to Romans chapter 14. Again, give you a little bit of right division this morning. In Romans chapter 14, the church at Rome, they had believers in that church that were made up of what? Jews and Gentiles. In Romans 14. The church today, yeah, do we have Jews in the church here? Anybody that was a Jew? Circumcision before? Nobody? All right. So we only have Gentiles. But at that time, there was, in this transition period, there was Jews and Gentiles. There was Jews that heard Paul's my gospel, got saved into the body of Christ, and in that church possibly could be visiting some little flock members could visit the church, this, uh, the, the body of Christ. They could be in that church. And if you've been trained for 40 years of your life that you should keep the law, you can't eat bacon. Robert was talking about bacon and somebody had a party yesterday because Robert's birthday was Thursday. I didn't get invited, by the way. This really, it wasn't a charitable thing on their part. But they had bacon. They had bacon. So in Romans 14, you could get to a fellowship there, and there is bacon on the table because the Gentiles like, oh, we love pork, man, we love some bacon. And that Jew, that for 40 years, he doesn't, he's still learning the doctrine. He's still learning about Christ in him. He's still learning about his liberties. He comes in there and says, you guys eat bacon. Oh, I'm so, I, I'm going to get out of here. He says to the body of Christ, you know what? You're not charitable if you say, oh, I can eat my bacon. I don't care what you feel. He says, rather don't eat that bacon. Don't put it out on the table because you could offend the other believer. That's what charity does. Do you get that? So you have to understand the context of Romans 14. A couple of verses there. Romans 14 verse 15. I'm not gonna, you can't read the whole passage. You go home and read the whole thing. Verse 15 says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Now, man, can we eat anything? Yes. yes. But there's some people that we maybe will have among us, or some people at that time that have somebody among them that feels like, oh, I should not be doing this, this is bad. Just because they're still a babe in Christ. They still don't understand that everything is sanctified by the word in prayer. They don't know that. But for them it's bad. And so what you do is like, no, no, I can eat it. I don't care about your feelings, how you feel about it in your immature state. I'm going to use my right as a believer in Christ today with my liberty to eat what I want and I don't care how you feel about it. That's not charity. That's not charitable. You're going to have to take that guy in a charitable way, one side at some time, and slowly but surely, little by little, teach him the truth so that he understands what is your what the liberty is that we have in Christ Jesus. Do you understand that? Verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. How do you destroy him? He could lose all, he could lose all 
Now, if that's what the church, the body of Christ is about, I want nothing to do with it. I'm out of here. Let not them, let not, sorry, verse 16. Let then your good be, sorry, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. If I'm going to offend you with my drink, don't drink it. If you're going to offend you with my meat, don't eat it. Because I want, I'm seeking your unconditional benevolence and your edification. That's what I'm seeking. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. When we do that and we serve God in that capacity with a charitable manner, it's acceptable God uh, to God and it's approval of men. That means men get our approval. You get that? Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith we may edify another. For me destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Because when you do that, you're not charitable. You're not walking charitably. You're not thinking of his edification. You're not thinking of his good. Now sometimes people can be jerks. So, sorry to say it that way. And we've got to deal with those people at that, at, at, at that level of, a charitable level even, long-suffering and forbearing. Not provoking, you know. It's hard sometimes, right, to be charitable. Because some people just provoke you. They just get under your skin. They're just that type of person. They're just like, hmm, I'm going to get in there. And I'm, you know, like, oh, Lord, charity is not working right now on me. And it's not your fault. It's my fault because I'm not having your word effectually working in me that believeth. You guys with me? And I even didn't even get to the second part of this message this morning we're going to start there and we'll finish we'll start it the next week we'll start here but go with me to first timothy first timothy are you guys hearing me or at least learning something this morning about charity in first timothy chapter one paul is setting timothy and tells him to set things in order at ephesus and first timothy chapter one Charity is God's doctrinal design for the body of Christ. The end of God's commandment, the end of all that God wants to produce for us here right now is charity. The end result of what God wants for us, the pinnacle, the ultimate that God wants for us is to be charitable, to have to walk in charity. <clears throat> First, First Timothy chapter 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that I might charge some that they teach no other what? Why would Paul do that? Because as soon as Paul would leave an area, guess what happens? He leaves Galatia. He's, in, he's two years in Galatia preaching Christ and him crucified, preaching the, what we have in Christ, our standing in Christ, our justification, uh, as the finished work of the cross. He's preaching it for two years and Paul leaves. And as soon as he's gone, guess what happens? The Jews come in and say, ah, whoa, 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 whoa. Unless you circumcise and unless you keep the law, unless, 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 you can't be righteous. And so they start mixing the law with grace. It's always the Jews. And today, it's not the Jews that comes through that door to destroy our works. It's those people that think they are spiritual Israel today that comes in and destroys our work. Because we're not spiritual Israel. We are the body of Christ joined to the head, which is the head of the body of Christ. This is who we are. So Paul says to them, he says, that they teach no other doctrine, but Paul has taught them, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. Endless genealogies, where would that come in? What, 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 what's connected with endless genealogies? 
Are you from the tribe of Benjamin? Are you from the tribe of Judah? Are you connected in some way, shape, or form from the seed line of Christ? Who cares? Because we're in Christ. I'm bound to the head, man. Now, the end of the commandments... Is it, uh, sorry, let's read this form. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now, the end of the commandment is what? Charity. The end of the command. That means the end result. What ultimately we want to get out of that is charity. How does charity come? Out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned. When we have those things, the ultimate production is what? Charity. Verse 6 says, From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whether they affirm. People today that want to teach you the law, they know what they say and don't know what they affirm. They have no clue. They are clueless. You have to rightly divide the word of truth to have some clue about what's going on. Don't teach any other doctrine. Don't mix law with grace. We'll talk about that when we come in to start talking about charity in the next couple of weeks further. God's ultimate design for us is the perfecting of the saints. When Paul says in Colossians 1, I warn you, I teach I preach that I might present every man where? Perfect. Our job here is to preach to you the word of God and as you get God's word in you, it starts working in you ultimately to do what? For the perfecting of the saints. Why? Before the perfected saints does the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is not for imperfect saints. It's for perfected saints. It's for saints... That, that, that knows and understand who they are in Christ, because they alone really can edify the body of Christ. The others can do it, but only to the degree that they know and understand some things. But if their knowledge is in the absence of spir- wisdom and spiritual understanding, it is dangerous. It doesn't edify. It will puff up and it will destroy. And we're going to look at some passages that talks about that. When I went through 1 Corinthians 13 and I seek all those things that are not provoked easily, I realized I get provoked pretty easily. Okay? Yeah, Kathy, you look at me like, look, you should be preaching. You shouldn't be get provoked easily. Like you perfect there, you know? <laughs> you know, somebody cuts us off, you know, or, or not just somebody in the road cuts us off, you know? Or we come into church and somebody is sitting at our spot. I'm like, <laughs> you know, you get so mad because somebody is sitting at your seat. Well, I grew up in the Baptist church. Well, I, grew up in the, I grew up in the Dutch Reformed church and I went to the Baptist church after that when I met John, my high school girlfriend. She was like 14 and I was like 15 and here we are. Married 35, 36 years this, I don't know, long, Okay. Not long, bad, long, good, okay? <laughs> Just want to clarify that. But in the Baptist church, Edith Blake, Edith Blake, Miss Blake would come, and she was, a, she was a spinster, never married, her whole life. And she would come in, she was like 90 years old, and she comes in with a cane, and she walks in, and if somebody came into church to visit, and they're sitting on a chair, she would walk up with her cane, poke them, you're in my seat. <laughs> That was not charitable, okay? <laughs> you guys get the picture of what charity is? And we're going to talk about this for the next week. I, th- I think you're going to be edified by it, and I know I've been edified by it, and I'm excited to go through this information about charity. Father, we thank you for your grace and your great love. We thank you for that love of, for that, you, that you, you, you commended your love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, your son Jesus Christ died for us. We thank you, Father, that the love of Christ constraineth us, takes hold of us, and it moves us. We thank you for your great love. We thank you that we can display that love in our actions as we understand what charity is and what it produces and what it holds together for your praise and for your glory and edifying to your body of Christ. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints here this morning. As we're going to eat a meal together here and as we're going to break bread and drink together, 
We are always reminded of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose body was broken for us and whose blood was shed for us in Calvary. As we do this together, we always do this in remembrance of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ's death, till He comes. We thank You for the fellowship we can enjoy, and as we tarry one for another this morning, we pray that our conversation, our fellowship, be to Your praise and to Your glory, done in the bond of perfectness, which is charity. We pray these things by Christ for thanksgiving. Amen.